Hello everyone and welcome to this um, episode in the Unlocking Behaviour Change series. I am delighted to be able to um, welcome to this uh, channel Chris Horner, who I've known for some years now and he's my go-to person when it comes to philosophy and all things intellectual and erudite. And um, I thought of Chris when I watched a, a video on YouTube from um, Sabine Hossenfelder. She's a physicist and she does some really interesting uh, videos about physics and other things. And she did a video on free will. And I thought it was really good. Um, it, the, the, the basic premise was that free will doesn't exist, but uh, it's not a problem. And I uh, posted uh, a tweet saying that this was, a, this was uh, a pretty good video and people should watch it. And some people who I deeply respect came back to me and said, it's a rubbish video. <laughs> it completely misses the point and gets it all wrong. And I just couldn't quite see it, uh, what, what their objection was. So, it, But it prompted me to think about free will a bit more and to engage uh, with Chris, uh, who has very kindly agreed to take us through some of the philosophy um, of free will. Um, and we're going to come at the end of this video to some views on it, uh, which I think are pretty damn good, but <laughs> but not everyone may agree. So uh, Chris, can you just tell us a very little bit about yourself? Oh, well, I've, I've uh, been writing or teaching and thinking about philosophy for uh, a number of decades. Um, I've taught philosophy, philosophy of politics, aesthetics, um, uh, and uh, ethics and uh, other related areas for most of my uh, adult life, uh, both in uh, at various sorts of institutions, university, um, but also but mainly adult education. Fantastic. Well, so here's the thing: um, you will have encountered this even more than I do as a psychologist, um, and that is if you try and um, discuss free will with people, and particularly if you want to say that there's no such thing as free will or that the, the concept doesn't even make any sense. Uh, people get very emotional. Um, wh why do you think that is? Why do, pe why do we as humans have such a strong need to have this concept of free will or some kind of concept of free will? I think, I think uh, people do want a sense of control over their lives. And what they think determinism is telling them is they don't have it. They are the mere puppet of obscure uh, and uh, inhuman forces that are making them act out something and that they are, as it were, fooled so that behind the curtain is the real deal. And the real deal is inhuman anyway. So I think that's one of the things. I think there's a worry that people have that if uh, determinism in some sense or, you know, if there isn't any free will, because we haven't discussed what determinism is, but if there isn't free will, uh, then what happens to morality? I mean, how are we going to praise or blame? Uh, not just the good and evil, but also kinds of actions that we wish to approve of or disapprove of in a more general sense. So there's that worry. I think there's a kind of ideology as well, kind of ideology of choice is good, and this seems to be taking choice away. Uh, and I think there may even be a theological hangover. You know, there's, there is, you know, you can be, um, a sort of secular Protestant or a secular Catholic, I think, you know, our culture is permeated and, and sometimes for good. You know, I'm not I'm not um, trying to make some point here about uh, badness of religion, but nonetheless, even people who regard themselves as fully secular, I think have there's a kind of cultural hangover about choice, freedom and being good or bad, which uh, still um, gives people a problem when they think it's been taken away. I love this idea of the secular Protestant and the secular Catholic. Presumably there's also the secular Jew, the secular um, Muslim, the secular Buddhist. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I'm, the... <laughs> <speculator>. <laughs> I'm just speaking, I'm only mentioning Protestants and Catholics because that's my cultural background, mm. not those the others, but I would not be surprised. I, don't, I mean, one doesn't want to get sidetracked in it, but it's such a cool idea because, of course, it is the case that... Um, uh, those religions embody certain value systems, certain principles, certain ways of thinking about ourselves that don't require you to believe in a God of any sort. They're value systems and belief systems as well. 
Um, but I don't, anyway, I don't want to uh, uh, sidetrack us on that. Okay, so the question- about karma next. <laughs> yes, karma. Well, that's right. Um, so the, then the, that brings us very neatly to the question of what's the alternative or what are the alternatives to the notion, to this uh, concept of free will, which we're going to have to um, sort of break down at some point. But what you mentioned determinism. What do you understand by the concept of determinism? I think that it's the notion that if we had a complete knowledge of everything at the start of the universe, we'd be able to predict what lunch you were going to eat next week, Robert, on a uh, Wednesday uh, at one o'clock. We would know what that was because the, the immensely, a God's eye view, as it were, would give us an immensely complex picture, which would include something which was already always going to happen because of the initial state then leads to a mass of causes, which leads to a mass of effects, which goes on unimaginably hugely and unimaginably long through, uh, you know, through time, and that we would know what would happen. In other words, uh, that the physics, as it were, is telling us that uh, cause and effect is a, a set of unbreakable chains, uh, and that that therefore means that there is only one thing you could do. You couldn't choose, uh, Robert, between asparagus uh, and runner beans. Well, you, you would choose, but of course, that, that, that you were always going to choose asparagus or, or runner beans, because I don't have access to that computer, so I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so the idea then is, and I, I want to make sure we get this absolutely right, because there's a lot of confusion around it. The idea is not that it's actually possible to predict, or that it would ever be possible, actually, no. to predict uh, what unfolds in the universe, um, but that... Um, that but because of you know it, it just you know because of all the sort of complexities associated with it but that there is an inescapable causal sequence which takes um the universe from one state at this particular point in time to another state at another point in time and everything in it including ourselves and so um, you know, one of the objections, I think, to the idea of determinism is the idea, well, you can't predict. And, but determinism doesn't necessarily say you, you, can, you right. can predict. It just says that it will happen. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and I have this sort of thought experiment, uh, which, which I've tried out on many people, and you're the only people who's been, person who's been kind enough to not laugh in my face about in relation to it. But the, uh, you know, the thought experiment is just simply a very, that the idea that if we look at what's happened in the past, um, we can say, well, that happened. It definitely happened, right? If we look, if we then move us, um, but when we look into the future, we say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. It could be this, it could be that. But if we then move ourselves into the future plus a second or a minute or a week, that thing that was in the future for us a little while ago is now in the past and it definitely happened. Yeah. And therefore, the only difference between those two things, which definitely happened was where we were in time in relation to them. So at one point, they were the future for us, and at the other point, they were the past for us. So, so everything that happens definitely happens. And if, something, if everything that happens definitely happens, it definitely... <laughs> I know it sounds sort of like ridiculously sort of straightforward, but it seems sort of inescapable then that the idea that even if you don't believe in cause and effect if you simply believe that stuff happens, that there it is, you know, there's no, there is no escape. Um, but, you, you, you know, other people have said, well, that's nonsense, but I never really understood why. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think that, I mean, I want to come later on perhaps to, to some questions around that because one needs to think about all the position of the observer or the observer participant, I mean, oneself, there is a tendency to draw to actually have a picture of this in which one, without re really noticing what one's doing, one supposes oneself to be in a dog-like position, looking down at a virtual version of Robert or Chris and saying, "Look, there he is. Um, there was the past. That's the and that you start now. So it may be, it may be we may need to rethink that model, but I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to say. 
Um, of course, and the version of determinism I just gave is a simple, if not simplistic, it's the received view of, of what that would mean, which would be simply that, so I think was it Laplace, uh, somebody that said, you know, uh, you, you, the initial conditions essentially predetermine everything that's going to happen. Yeah. And that, that's a version of it. I mean, there are multiple ways of, uh, of talking about this, but I think that's right. Well, that actually, very neatly, as it happens, brings us to um, this uh, uh, a, a brief, brief sort of summary of the approaches that have been adopted to date on all of this stuff. And uh, you've listed a few of them, which um, would be quite useful, I mean, to, to very briefly go through. The first one of these is uh, that you mentioned is libertarianism. What's libertarianism? Well, firstly, not to be confused with the political stance, which is sometimes called uh, libertarianism. That's entirely different. And I'm not, I'm not going there for a lot of reasons. Uh, libertarianism in this context is, is a bit what it sounds like, because it's what you, the clue is in the name, liberty. It's the notion that we have free will. That means that we have, in some sense, an independent capacity to choose asparagus or runner beans which is not determined in any way by what happened before. I could go, I can raise my hand or I can lower it again. I just chose to do that. I might not have done that. I'm somehow independent or not constrained by the previous uh, state of affairs that led me to do that or didn't need me to do that in, pra in, in practice. So uh, what's attractive about that to many people is it seems to fit the intuition, the lived reality that I feel as if I can raise my hand or lower it um and uh it uh has a sense of control the very thing that people want um now i mean i think there are some problems with this one of them is you have to try to ask the question how is that integrated into everything else we know about the natural world i mean are we saying that we have some uh, sp uh you know are we saying we have some non-physical thing a sort of descartes uh floating consciousness which is making decisions which is utterly unconnected with the physical world of cause and effect if we are then there's another question which would be how would it ever intervene for if i had an insubstantial self which was um sort of somehow pressing the buttons the levers of action how is it doing that i mean what goes on i mean that question was asked right back in the time of descartes I mean, it's not a new question how would an immaterial self make material events occur and you might say well why are we bringing up in immaterial self well because if we're claiming that we have something which is not part of the natural world, because it's at least not part of the world of physics as we know it, which is somehow initiating action, but is not itself in any way caused, then we've got a big metaphysical problem here. We've got a big metaphysical problem, how that fits. And, and by the way, another question might come up, which would be, if you're really going to commit to that, why, why wouldn't those decisions made by the immaterial uh, will be arbitrary since they're not being forced in any way? Why am I choosing? I, well, why does Robert choose asparagus? You know, has he done it for no reason at all? If he's done it for a reason, isn't that operating like a cause? Uh, or you might say, well, no, Robert could reject that cause. He could say, well, I like asparagus, but it's about time I had runner beans. The problem with that is you're saying, yes, OK, but then there's a reason for why he did that. Mm. Uh, so I, I think we have got ourselves in a web of problems if we, and, and I think also there's a, and there's that theological thing, perhaps, you know, the soul or the immaterial mm. stuff. I think also there's a, something that Nietzsche wrote about actually, which is this um, kind of cult around this notion of an end of a free will, a will. It's there. I can identify it. Uh, but but I don't quite know what that thing is. And I mm. think we've mystified more than clarified. And uh, going back to Sabine's, Sabina's, so Sabine's um, uh, uh, video, uh, uh, the criticism, a very interesting to me criticism, was that, well, if you, be if you deny the free will, if you believe in determinism, somehow um, then the, it's all... You know, and I think they were objecting to the idea that it was all physics. Um, but physics is just a level of analysis. Psychology yeah. is another level of analysis. Chemistry, sociology, geography, and, you know, all of these things are levels of analysis. And if it were the case that this sort of uh, libertarian view was correct, 
um, then there would be no point in psychology. I mean, they, they actually argued that there'd be no point in psychology if there was no such thing as free will. But to me, it's there'd be no point in psychology if there was no such, if there were such a thing as free will, because you could never understand it. As you say, you'd be saying people's choices and the behaviours are ultimately um, uh, under the control of something that is not subject to laws of cause and effect. So, so that would be the end of all science to do with human behaviour. Yeah, I think it would be a very, very complex and difficult world to live in. Uh, I mean, it, it would be, it, you could, I don't know. I mean, those individuals that wish to defend that point of view had better come out with a better account. I mean, you know, I might not be that person, but the, the you know, the account might be something like, well, um, uh, why, why was that individual, um, uh, let's say, um, addicted to that substance? Or why, or why was that individual reliving this traumatic event in certain kinds of ways? in sim symptoms which are problematic you know there are all sorts of behaviors we might want to talk about and and if we suppose that it's there's a kind of completely free will which is uncaused then uh, then the individual is still going to have to give a narrative as to why it was that they were repeating those certain kinds of actions or indeed why it was that, that individual felt constrained in in various sorts of ways uh, yeah. because in some sense and somehow whether we're talking at the level of physics sociology psychology or philosophy we are in the web of life we're in the web of life yeah. and trying to give an account which cuts us free from it makes things harder not easier um now that doesn't mean necessarily opt for the view that individuals are mere puppets uh, uh you know this sort of worry that people have but it, it however and i don't want to sort of as it were pre pre uh prejudge you know where we're going to go with this but I, I would certainly say wherever we wherever we go with this, we, we need to think sensibly about the actual way in which we are part of a larger society. We're not simply monads or little atoms of self making little decisions, which is then the, the only problem is, oh, um, did I do it because because of my mummy or, di or did I do it utterly freely? Uh, yeah. It's also interesting where that question may be. We've also got to see ourselves as part of a wider social ensemble, I think. Yeah, 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 it's a really good point. Well, so um, we've talked a little bit about uh, determinism. What about this thing called compatibilism? What, what is that? Yeah. Well, I think compatibilism is, uh, 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 may have its problems as well, but it, it tries to sort of like not, not have the problems we've just talked about. Compatibilism is a bit like what it sounds like, right? So it's kind of like bring, bringing together a sense of what freedom might be with a sense of what um, determinism is or might be. So you're, you're sort of saying uh, reasons are causes, okay? So Robert chooses asparagus. Uh, by the way, I'm in, no, I'm in no position to know whether you prefer asparagus to run the beans. I, I think I do. But well, I wouldn't do. always, but I wouldn't always have asparagus. Sometimes I have beans. Well, there you go. Free will. <laughs> I've just been refuted. Anyway, so back to the thing. Um, reasons are causes. You know, you, you, you have the character that you have. And you have the desires that you have and you want to do the things that you want to do um and freedom simply means being free from external constraints right so no, if if you get to the uh kitchen uh and uh, or, or or maybe it's the it's the cafeteria in, in the college and you reach for the asparagus and someone gets in front of you pushes you back and says i'm having that last bit well okay you couldn't get it then you weren't free someone stopped you but freedom, now, it's compatibilism because it's the idea that um, the desires that you have and the reasons that you have are caused. You know, so the character that you have isn't your, you don't construct your own character. You don't make your own character from the ground up. I mean, however much we may be responsible as adults, there's an interesting question to use at this point, but however much responsibility we have, it isn't the case that all of our desires came self-generated, pulled up by our bootstraps. We have them. We have certain desires. So in those, that would be the bit that we are not in control of. So provided no one stops me from doing what I want to do, that's what we're going to call freedom. Um, uh, that, that's broadly what it is. I mean, it has attractions because it's, it's not cutting itself free from um, the causal network. You know, it's saying you, you, what, you, know, you like asparagus. Maybe, maybe because, you know, your mother encouraged you to eat it. Or maybe because she didn't. That might be another one. See, that's the trouble with these causal accounts. They, they can all often be turned around. Anyway, um, the point is you have the desires that you have, and that's not 
simply coming out of a floating X, which is this sort of free will. And that freedom is understood as freedom from external constraint, right? Now, the only problem that people, oh, well, I say the only problem, that's a dangerous thing to say in philosophy, but a problem that people have with that is they think, actually, I still haven't been told that I'm free. You know, this is a restatement of, of, um, of a lack of freedom because I didn't control my desires, I didn't control my reasons. They are simply what they are. So I think that that's, that worries some people, but I think in, in many ways, compatibilism is a better answer than, uh, than some others. Yeah, um, and actually very, you know, topical at the moment when we are in the midst still, in case anyone was doubting it, of COVID, um, where the Westminster government is saying, basically, you're on your own chums, you know, uh, it, you have to take responsibility, you have the free will to uh, take precautions as you see fit. But of course, the reality is, for almost everybody, that they don't. Uh, actually, uh, you know, however much they may want to in some circumstances. So um, not only do we have the issue of people's desires and preferences um, being shaped potentially by their environment and the kind of people they are and so on and so forth, but even if they wanted to, they still can't do things. If you've got to go to work, you know, if you're told you've got to go to work, even though you've got COVID, you've got to go to work even if you've got, you know, someone puts a gun to your head, you're, you're not free. So, um, so that's, that's, I quite like that one. Um, then there's, then there's pragmatism, which, which sounds all very good to me, but, um, has some issues. Well, it has certain merit. I mean, by the way, that point you just made about going to work, I, I want to come back to that, uh, because when we, when we come towards perhaps the end of this discussion, I've got, I've got a few thoughts about that. Um, but um, with, with pragmatism, which I'll, I'll be very brief about now, pragmatism is a very big, broad word covering a lot of different philosophers, right? Um, which I won't, I won't name drop because we're trying to talk about the ideas here, I think. Uh, however, there are varieties of it, just to be fair, in case somebody puts in the comments that, well, you just missed out, so-and-so. Um, and a very crude, quick and dirty in our, uh, version of this is not a very precise uh, description, but broadly speaking, speaking pragmatists say um, uh, that, they, that, that when we give accounts of the world and when we do science and when we do religion and when we do art what matters is what works right so what they do is they they are ditching what is called the correspondence theory of truth you know the traditional correspondence theory of truth is the idea that a proposition is true if it corresponds with a state in the world what pragmatists point out is there's no independent way of accessing the world outside of the network of concepts and understandings that we have and so um, what we have are sort of regimes of, of truth. We, we have ways of saying, yes, that was a warranted claim. No, that wasn't. Uh, and the ultimate test will be, um, to what extent does it work for us? Now, how does that play into our discussion? Well, some people have argued, and they don't have to be strict pragmatists. I've heard people making this case, even if they wouldn't call themselves that. They, would, they might say this, look, the language of freedom works when we're talking about going shopping or, or buying, or would you like asparagus or would you like run the beans? That, that, that works, you know. Um, the, the deeper level, uh, at the level of physics, well, we might have a completely different answer and we might have to abandon that way of talking about people and just use the language of, of, of fit. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm using a big lumpy way of using the word physics here, but you know what I mean. Uh, and but it won't matter because when we're talking at one level, that works. When we're talking at another, this works. Um, my problem with this, I don't know what you think. I mean, I think this is, you know, a much more sophisticated approach than some of the ones we've been talking about. But I'm interested in what is the truth. I mean, I'm still interested. Maybe I'm old, fa- I mean, I'm old fashioned about this, but I'm interested in kind of like what is the case? Uh, and a pragmatist will say, you know, you're asking a redundant question. Right. But I don't think it's a redundant question. I think it's I think that that version I've just given, which wouldn't be everyone's. But one version that I've just given, that I call that giving up. Mm-hmm. I, and I, uh, I 
I think I agree with you on that. Um, because, and I think, funnily enough, if you take a purely pragmatic approach, I think it is ultimately unpragmatic. And I think there is a reason why it is important to have a mind to what's actually happening in the world and not just what it is useful to believe is happening in the world. Um, because ultimately, if you, f if you focus your, your efforts and your attentions exclusively on what appears to you to be a pragmatic approach, it will fall down if to the extent that it isn't true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. so it's it it seems beguiling to say, well, I'm gonna, I'm just going to do what works. But it, the the problem is, if it isn't true, there's a very good chance at some point it will stop working. And yeah. and all and in relation to something like free will, it does have consequences because the way that you address behaviors such as uh, problem behaviors or addictive behaviors or politicians' behaviors or COVID self protection behaviors and so on. Um, depends on a, on a perspective on the world in relation to free will and responsibility and the extent to which we're part of a social network and so on, um, that is ultimately, ultimately, if it's not embedded in truth, that model will not create the right kind of interventions, I think. It's, uh, pragmatism has to have some bearing, ha has to derive from truth in some way. Of course, what their what their response would be would be something like, "Look, what, what we're saying, what truth is, is the you know, for instance, the scientific community, or let's take the subsets of it, the physics community, the chem, you know, they have rituals, if you like, routines, what criteria and standards, and that truth will truth will be a word we can use. They will say, but what it means is that it's passed all these tests." Right now, uh, but I agree with you. And, 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 and you know, uh, the thing is, firstly, um, you know, it does sometimes seem very discourse based. I mean, the thing is, there are some things which are or aren't the case. So if I get up in the night for it to, to get a snack, um, if the fridge doesn't have something in it, then it, it wasn't there. Um, if someone dies, they die. Right. And here's another. Oh, there are either weapons of mass destruction in Iraq under Saddam Hussein or there aren't. Um, I think we know the answer to that one. Uh, also, uh, the other thing is this. Here's an important point, I think, although my pragmatist friend, and some of my friends, some of my best friends, Robert, are pragmatists. Uh, but um, here's, here's one thing. Um, you know, what if there's a community of people who, who, who in their entire community, in the way of understanding the world, um, they regard a one group of people as a subclass? You know, they think a race. They think that race exists. They believe in race, okay, um, which we know is a you know a problem thing to do. And they believe that their race is a superior one to another race, and therefore therefore treat them as helots. They treat them as slaves, right? Well, what am I to say to that? I think there is a not only that is it morally appalling, you know, all that. It's also based on a lie. It it isn't true, and I don't want to say to those guys over there. Uh, oh, why don't you come and join us? We've just got a better life. We've worked out things better. I want to say, do you know what? Um, your understanding of biology, right, is really, really wrong. Your understanding of life is really wrong. And I think, so I think it's important not to give up on right and wrong when it comes to talking about what is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a really good example. Well, there's one last sort of um, kind of gasp effort on the part of the free willites. Uh, which is uh, which the, the, the straw which has been clutched, which is quantum mechanics, and this is very easily dispensed with. But the basic yeah. idea, if, if I understand it right, is that oh yeah, free will uh, is actually a quantum phenomenon because uh, in quantum mechanics, um, the the basic idea is that uh, the that uh, things that we think of as particles, electrons and so on, actually only exist in what they call superposition. That's in a probability distribution until they interact with, uh, it's called measurement, but it's not really measurement. They interact with some other uh, thing in the universe causally, in which case that superposition collapses into a, into a point where they can say, oh, the particle is definitely there. 
But until it does that, it can be anywhere, literally anywhere in the universe, depending on a sort of distribution, which is like a, which is a Gau what they call a Gaussian, a normal distribution. In other words, it's most likely to be here, but it could be here, could be here, could be here. And the idea then is that essentially free will is a manifestation of a of the quantum nature of the universe which is that everything exists only as a probability distribution until that point in time and that event occurs where the the wave function as it's called collapses into a, a singularity so um I, mean, I think I know what the problem with that is. <laughs> what do you think the well, problem I, with that is? I, I, so I, rather, I mean, I've, by the way, I think if we're going to if we're going to use quantum, we've got to use it in a different way. I'll, I'll come back to that, and even then, I'm not sure. God, I'm not a scientist, but um, this doesn't give you free will. I mean, why would it give you? What, what in what way does it contribute to the idea that you are somehow free? In fact, if anything, it produces randomness. It seems to me, from what little I know, it produces randomness, it produces uh, an arbitrariness. Uh, the, the original claim, what the free will people want to hang on to, is the idea that they, are, that they have a will that directs itself here and not there, whether it be asparagus getting married or looking for weapons in Iraq. Uh, they're making a decision about what they want to do. I don't see how any of that... Now, what it might do is... And I'm not the guy to ask about this because that's not my area, you know, but it, what it might do is interestingly complicate our account of what the universe, I think it does, what the universe is and interestingly complicate how we think about um, events and how we think about lots of things. But what it can't do is deliver you free will. Mm. That's uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and as you say, we'll come back to it at the end. But um, I sort of have a, you know, as you know, a, a kind of version of this that I think actually could work. Um, it's not, it's not quantum mechanics as such, but it's sort of let's call it quantum psychology. Um, yeah. But we'll come back to that. So okay, well. So this is where we are. Um, we've sort of looked at all the various options um, and we've touched on the idea that uh, the notion of free will serves a function in society in terms of praise, blame, uh, responsibility and so on. Um, so uh, which is indisputable. I mean, you know, it, 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 if, if we don't think that uh, uh, someone should be punished because it's not their fault for something what are we going to do with that person are we really just going to let them off you know what's our <laughs> what, yeah. what's our idea um now as a psychologist as a behavioral scientist i think this is absolutely crucial because i think that that actually uh, taking away the idea of responsibility and and uh and praise and blame uh, for a person means that you can focus on behavior change techniques that will work. It may involve praise and blame. It may involve other things, but it may not. And it may not do it in a way that, um, uh, that you expect. So, for example, it turns out that, that, you know, that one of the reasons that uh, some people engage repeatedly in problem behaviors is that they have difficulty, their brains have difficulty learning from punishment. Um, they, it's not that they don't feel bad when they get punished, they feel very bad, but the brain just doesn't learn very well for, from it. And testosterone is quite a good hormone at preventing us from learning from punishment. Okay, so it's not going to really work. It's not that it's immoral or whatever, uh, or it, it's just not even going to work to keep punishing people like that. If you want to control their behavior and stop them doing the things that are really annoying, um, you've got to find another way of doing it. So you've got to get away from the idea of responsibility and blame and praise as your only behavior change weapons. Um, but I want to go on now to your um, your idea, the big idea around <laughs> the past and the future. Well, and I don't know how big an <laughs> well, I, I thought big it was a big idea, idea when you mentioned it. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, by the way, I, I do I do endorse, I agree you know, from my perspective, what you say. We, we live in a world where we talk about obesity, addiction, entirely as if it was the individual being lazy, stupid, naughty, and that we need to smack them. So there's a, a retributivist approach. You are a bad person. It's like a, a children's playground. She smacked him on the arm, therefore he should smack her on the arm. And this is somehow making it all okay. It seems like magical thinking. And I mean, something David, if I could just mention before we move on, David Hume said an intelligent thing about this. He said, you know, people's character 
uh, sometimes is their misfortune, right? Uh, they're no more responsible for it than they are the color of their eyes. You cut, you should, what you should challenge is the behavior, not, not condemn the individual. Now, where this gets difficult isn't necessarily around an individual who smokes too much, but we might want to, you know, when we get to Jimmy Savile, it can become very difficult because we don't, we, we, we really want to say that man's evil. I mean, people really want to say that. Um, uh, I think David Hume's version of this would be to say, well, you know, just as the scorpion stings because that's its nature or the wolf attacks the sheep. Yes, we need to get that wolf away from the sheep in perhaps into a pen or something or even shoot it. I don't know. But this theological thing about an innately evil individual who needs to be shown the error of his ways by pain. You know, I understand the emotional reaction because he's a disgusting individual in so many ways to us. But it's not helpful, particularly, though, since individuals like that, thank God, are, or thank heavens, thank the universe, it are infinitesimally few. I'm not infinitesimally, but, you know, very, very few. Most people are, all of us, suffering from, in some ways, things we wish we didn't do. Um, and, and sometimes these are very serious issues. So I'm, that's my tuppence worth uh, to that. But just to get to, just to, get to this thought. Now, um, my, my, my thought um, is, is, is this. And, and remember, I'm, I, I'm philosophy. It's not, I'm not a scientist, not a physicist, and as it'll become clear from what I say. I, I mean, I noticed this when I was a very young person. I think a lot of other people will. I'm not claiming it's a fantastic insight. When we look back at the past, the past always looks necessary. It, it does. We say, I, I had to do that. What, once I'd chosen to go to that university, I was bound to meet that person. I chose that university for reasons that are completely explicable. You know, the world of the past is a necessary one. The world of the future always looks open. So we look at the future and we say, I can choose A or B. We look the minute we've done it, this is close to what you were saying. We did B. We didn't do A. Well, I'm what I would sort of suggest, and I think there are some physicists like Lee Smolin who might be arguing something like this, is that it is possible to say perhaps that the universe, as it were, sh must show itself to us. In, in this sort of ambiguous way. It might even be, and now I'm paddling very delicately in areas I don't know much about, that the past is the past of classical Newtonian physics, because as it were, the, the wave function has collapsed. It was this, it wasn't that. But that the future is in a sense, and in this, only in this sense, um, quantum, in, a, in super, a state of superposition. Now, none of this means that I'm resurrecting free will. All, all, because I'm talking about the total picture, not just me making a decision. So it doesn't it doesn't take us back to libertarianism. But it, I think it may be that the observer, that's oneself thinking about one's life, it, is bound to see the universe showing these two faces. Now, my thought, my additional final thought on that little bit would be if we're coming up with this weird antinomy, this weird problem, it may be that because we're asking the wrong question. It may be because we don't know enough, and it may be that we're asking a bad, a bad question, getting us a bad answer. So it may be that free will and determinism are, are bad or provisional answers to something which we haven't actually got a good answer to, partly because of the counterintuitive way that past and future, uh, as it were, presents itself to us. That's uh, so interesting. And would it be... Um doing a violence to your point of view uh, to say that the, the the reason we don't have a good answer or we don't have a, an answer that is universally satisfactory to us to this this question of free will is we don't have a good question yeah that's right <laughs> which is that's kind of interesting yeah. um and so and and i uh, and that it that is that is quite quantum in a way um because it uh it, it you know there's there's a way of looking at probability which is that it is a, a quantification of our uncertainty as observers of you know when you roll a dice uh, for example, because of the way that dice roll or a die rolls, you don't know whether it's going to come up with a one or a six or whatever. But the laws of physics haven't been suspended in that case. It's just that there's lots of infinitesimally small 
physical forces operating, which makes it really hard to predict uh, what's going to happen. So in that sense, you know, probability is an, obs- an observational thing. But what you're saying, as I understand it, is uh, also what an interpreta- a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics says, which is that there is an inherent indeterminacy uh, around what we would model as a probability distribution in the future. The future has an inherent indeterminacy. Um, And of course, this goes into all whole areas of the multiverse and so on, which we don't have time to go into. But, you know, in that, you know, every single possibility that could happen, you know, will happen in some universe. Well, you know, there's even some claim to be some evidence for that. So that's I I, I love that idea. But I also have another idea, um, which I which I mentioned to you when we uh, spoke about this before, which is which is actually like going back to the dice thing. And my idea is, is basically that uh, biological systems and humans in particular to a, a, a very clear extent, but all biological systems have built into them a dice or a pair of set of dice or a die, as we say, the equivalent of. In other words, they even though they're not violating necessarily any laws of physics, there's no actual, there may be no actual indeterminacy if you go down to a fine enough level of uh, of granularity. So biological systems have a built in, have built in dice, shall we say, or indeterminacy, randomness in that sense. And so, for example, if you look at if you look at a, the you know just a newborn child, and you look at the way its muscles are moving, its arms and legs are moving, I think, or I'd like to propose, that is that that movement is random, in the sense of it being random whether you get a one or a six when you roll the dice. It, the, its its nervous system is getting it to do stuff. When it comes to asparagus. And, and beans, um, a similar thing is operating, but just like with dice where it's not, it's not um, that anything can happen. You know, it's, it's very, un- it could at some point land on a corner, right? It is poss- it's physically possible. It won't, it doesn't happen, but essentially one of six things can happen, right? And Imagine a coin. Only one of two things can happen. So, in the in the case of a binary decision, one of two things could happen. You could I could choose uh, asparagus, or I could choose uh, a green beans. Um, but if it's a weighted coin, if it's a coin which has a bias in it, I could be more likely to choose asparagus. And if it's a weighted, if it's a coin which has a magnetic. Um, configuration such that in a particular environment the the the, uh, the heads comes up in one case and the tails comes up in another case then in a certain situation I could choose asparagus asparagus and in another situation I could choose green beans but not all the time just yeah. sometimes now yeah. I think that my, my proposition is that we have evolved to be like that to make us a bit unpredictable because if humans and, and biological systems were utterly predictable, in, if we, it, then it would be very maladaptive for us. Yeah. Um, we, we'd be very easily controlled and we'd end up in some kind of hopeless spiral. But we also need to be able to make different choices at different times and, and have the effects of those choices fed back so that we can learn from them. So it's part of, it's, it's like ontogenetic evolution requires random selection of responses, which requires randomness, just like phylogenetic evolution requires um, mutation, uh, which looks random, which isn't, it is random in one sense, but in another sense it's not. So what do you think? Is that, so is it's, that... ra- it's random in inverted commas. Yes. Is that fair? It's random. It, it will seem random. It will be random yeah. as, as the throw of the dice is, although yeah. a, a closer analysis of it won't, won't have left it as a sort of uncaused step. 
I mean, I, I'm not in a position to, to ultimately assess that because I'm not, you know, but it, 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 it seems like a plausible account. I mean, it, and though it's a, it's because it's a different kind of account to the one I gave. Mm. Um, it's, it's operating. I mean, I, it may be compatible. I mean, it may not be, you know, because you're talking, you're sort of talking about you're invoking evolution, if you like, or natural selection. And you're talking about how that might be and how also how that might be a model of how we how we act. Um, and I'm and I'm saying, well, you know, the the universe. And this sounds incredibly grand to use these terms. Today, the universe might might be such that the universe has to show up for us in a contradictory way, hmm. because the universe is contradictory, and because human consciousness, let's remember, is part of that universe. It's not a separate thing. It's in there. So these two these two accounts may not be incompatible. I mean, I mean, it would be for our viewers to perhaps you know lie down in a dark room <laughs> and consider but uh you know so yes i, I think that may well be the case i mean I, I won't comment beyond that because i don't mm. feel confident to mm. well it's I, I think they are i mean they're definitely compatible uh with each other the views i think both have uh, well uh, you know I, I like your your uh, proposition and and actually your your proposition also um goes to another issue which maybe is for another day which is the idea that in fact cause and effect are uh only exist in relation to an observer because um uh you know what happens happens and uh and an illustration of that is that you can have things that are caused by things not happening you know uh getting getting punished because you didn't do your homework well how does that work (laughs) So we have, so we have, we have a kind of. There's an account that we can associate with some philosophers to the effect that uh, that uh, what we call cause and effect is simply regularity, and we have an expectation. Other other people, and that sort of Hume, I guess. Other people like well, like Hegel and others, uh, many others actually have, have looked into. Well, yes, but let's go further into this and actually say perhaps a cause and an effect are kind of analytically linked. You know, an effect is only effect because it was it was a cause. Uh, and and that um, and that you know, things may be more complicated even than Hume thought, but but that as you say maybe for another day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well that's that's terrific. Um, I think um, we've given it a really good go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can, I, in... can I just make sorry yeah. to interrupt? Can I just very a very brief point about about what, one more thing I just like to like to mention? I don't know if that's for time. Um, it's this I, I i would like it if we actually thought about freedom in social terms when we're thinking about i mean you know people talk this moralistic language you know look but if i'm a fit individual who doesn't smoke and eats the right stuff and i'm poor it means that i can't access healthcare if it isn't free <laughs> right if i am if i smoke a lot eat a lot and i'm obese but very rich then i can access that freedom is profoundly connected to the kind of society you lead that you're in. And one argument might be that, you know, even the notion of autonomy itself is a developed historical one. We have a notion of giving reasons, accepting reasons, norms, and so on. A free society for me would be one that had institutions in it that I could reflectively endorse as, as, as contributing to the freedom, not just of myself, but of the social whole. So it might be that sort of the direction to go with freedom is to think of it as an historical and social thing and that we should get away from this constant idea that it is all about asparagus or beans mm. but it rather it's about um and again you know this is perhaps a different answer to the kind of question that we typically pose at the beginning but, but it's about a relational thing and about something which is other than the little self who is making choices freedom isn't just choice it's a lot more than that. That's a beautiful point on which to end. I and I completely agree with you. Um, what that means is, if I understand it right, is that the freedom of the individual, so-called, which is touted by uh, certain sectors of society, is actually um, something which only exists because of social structures that are created to enable it. Um, and that is genuine freedom when you have social structures that create environments which are in, um, facilitatory. 